Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Before we begin, just a reminder to please leave your questions till the end of the presentation. You can enter these in the chat. And please, please answer a brief survey that will be sent to you immediately after the rounds. It will let us know that you were present today. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to make a brief land acknowledgement. McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which we now gather. We are fortunate to have our speaker today from the Division of Palliative Care. Dr. Justin Sanders is the Cappy and Eric M. Flanders Chair of Palliative Care, Director of the Division of Palliative Care at McGill University. He also directs the Division of Supportive and Palliative Care at the MUHC. He is a family and palliative care physician and communication researcher. He joined our Department of Family Medicine as an associate professor in 2021, following eight years on staff at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School. His research and teaching focuses on promoting equity in serious illness care through promotion of high quality communication and authentic healing relationships. We're very fortunate to have with us today, Dr. Sanders. The floor is yours. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Nadia. And thanks to everybody who's here online um, and in the room, of course. Um, so I'm really grateful for the chance to be here. Um, I've been here practicing at the MUHC for two years now, and, um, and it's given me an opportunity to do a lot of reflection on sort of where we are, where we've come from in palliative care at this institution, and then to think about where I think we should be going. And so I think it's, I wanted to share that with you um, so that you have a sense. And so um, as we move forward and work on our initiatives, we have an opportunity to work together and you understand where we're, where we're coming from. So um, I do not have any financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. I do always think, think it's important to say that I'm a white, cisgendered, able-bodied and heterosexual, middle-class, married male, palliative care physician and researcher and a father of two. And the reason I think it's important to say this is because these are the lenses through which I view the world and try to look around um, through my clinical work and my research. And so I offer that as a, uh, as a disclosure of sorts. <clears throat> and I like ice cream. So in terms of objectives, my hope is to describe that you'll be able actually to describe the history of palliative care at the MUHC and its potential influence on current practices in palliative care. Um, that uh, you will be able to cite three key studies that shape our thinking about the value and role of palliative care in the lives of those affected by serious illness. And that you'll be able to adopt strategies to integrate supportive and palliative care earlier into the care of people with cancer and other serious illnesses. So the history of palliative care at the MUHC is a very rich one, in fact, um, in part because uh, palliative care took its name uh, at the Royal Victoria Hospital. This is Dr. Balfour Mount. Many of you probably have met Dr. Mount um, through the course of your training or work. Um, he was a McGill urologic surgeon. Um, who in the 19, early 1970s um, was invited to attend a lecture at the McIntyre building by this physician. Um, this is the Swiss American psychiatrist, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who wrote some of the early um, foundational work on uh, people who were dying. And she came in 1971 to give this talk and Dr. Mount was invited along and he was incredibly struck by what she was talking about. She had done something revolutionary at the time, which was to talk to people who were dying. And as much as people who are dying represented in some way through the history of allopathic medicine, the failures of our efforts to, to save them, um, we kind of shifted them out of view historically within hospitals. And so she did something radical and she sat down with them and talked to them about their experience and the things that she learned from them, she wrote about um, in some important books um, on the subject, which I encourage people to read and which she came to talk to uh, the physicians at McGill about. So um, following this experience, he read, he, he read uh, her books and he was struck by uh, some of the 
works that she cited by another physician um, in the United Kingdom. This is Dame Cicely Saunders. Dame Cicely Saunders was a fascinating person. She wasn't always a dame, but she started her career as a nurse, uh, as a Nightingale nurse in the UK in response to, sort of as a part of a patriotic response um, to um, the end of the war. And she, um, but she found because of some back problems that she struggled with the physical labor of being a bedside nurse. And so she retrained as what was called an alderman, which was kind of like a, um, a social, what we think of as a social worker in the hospital. And, um, and she was encouraged through some of her mentors actually to eventually apply to medical school, so she, which she did. And, um, and so she was sort of sat in this unique role of being both a woman, a nurse, a social worker, and a, and a physician um, in the 1960s. And um, shortly after she completed her training in internal medicine, she went and she worked in a hospice called um, St. Joseph's Hospice in East London in Hackney, where she really started to give shape um, with the authority of a physician to some of the ideas that she'd been um, sort of sitting with since the time of her nurse, which were really about our failures to care for people who were dying of cancer, um, whose experience was almost, you know, almost uniformly categorized by uncontrolled pain, psychological distress, social isolation. And, um, and she really um, started to think, articulate some important ideas about how we could understand that distress and to treat it. She, uh, let's see, she articulated what is one of the sort of radical foundational ideas about what palliative care is, which is called total pain, which is the idea that um, the multiple uh, forms of distress, psychological, social, physical, that occur in the context of the end of life intersect with each other and have an impact on each other um, and, and, and certainly necessitate therefore a multidisciplinary approach to treatment, which she herself in some way embodied. I mean, the fact is that she, she herself represented three members of our, of our interdisciplinary team, a social worker, a nurse, and a physician. So Balfour Mount did something that you did in the 1970s, which is you called people on the phone, no matter where they were, a landline, and he picked up the landline and he called uh, St. Christopher's Hospice, which she had founded in 1967, and which is still thought of as the first modern hospice. And he said, I'd like to come learn from you. And she said, well, this isn't gonna be a vacation, like come prepared to work. And so he went over there for three weeks and, um, and he learned some of the important things that, they, that she had learned and, and was teaching about how to care for people at the end of life in a hospice. And he came back to Montreal and he said, I wanna start a hospice in a hospital, which didn't exist at the time. And so um, he was told, Absolutely, you know, sure, we're interested. Uh, in fact, Dean Cruz and Sylvia Cruz at the time were very supportive of his efforts to try to improve um, care of the dying in the hospital. It wasn't uniformly the case across the hospital. Um, and uh, he formed a service that was providing end of life care for people in the hospital, particularly people with cancer. At the time, he was told, like, you can't he was told by a friend, like, we can't call it hospice, though. It has to be called something different because the, the Francophone of Quebec won't accept this term of hospice because of its association with almshouses for the poor. And so I think it was in the shower, he writes in his book, that he came up with the idea, the term uh, palliative care. Um, palliative drawing, drawn from the Latin pallium, which means to cloak or shelter. And so thus, thus palliative care was born. And in 19, early 1970s, um, he started a palliative care service. I think probably they first, he first started seeing patients in consultation probably in 19, late 1973. Uh, and in, on January 21st, 1975, so almost 50 years ago, in two months, the palliative care unit opened at the Royal Victoria Hospital. And it was the first hospital-based palliative care unit and, um, and it was, it's very much true that this was conceptualized as a hospice in a hospital. So palliative care at the time was really thought to be just that. And it reflected this model of care, which as you can see by this uh, thing on the left here that says old, is an outdated model of care, which in which patients received a diagnosis of a serious illness, they had life prolonging care as long as possible. And then someone came into the room and said, um, this is, there's nothing more we can do. And they transitioned them to hospital or hospice-based end of life care. And this was the model of care for the first probably 30 years of palliative care. Um, and 
since the, in the last 20 years, we've been working with a new model of care, which really, dem which is evidence-based and shows that the that patients who are diagnosed with a serious illness should have palliative care introduced and then integrated progressively through the course of their ser serious illness alongside life prolonging or disease modifying care. And at some point that care becomes um, entirely uh, sort of comfort focused and then and, and therefore may be managed mostly by palliative care. And then the model extends even further in caring for those who are left behind through their bereavement. And so this is what, this is how we, those of us who do palliative care think about what palliative care is now. Um, now I would challenge people to think about what model of care you see in this hospital, because I would say that in the last couple of years, what I've seen is that there's still a lot of people who think that we're in the first model, um, that we do everything, that care, that care on this side of this line here is quote unquote active, not sure what we do in palliative care, but it's also active treatment for, for people. But the um, but it's reflected in the language that we use. For example, when we refer to people as palliative or when we say that people go into palliative care, this reflects an outdated model of care that isn't supported by evidence. And so um, I, I think that, um, you know, part of this may have to do with how we started palliative care in this institution. And I'm excited to share some evidence that tells you why I think it should, why it should look like the bottom model. To, to illustrate further sort of what I think of, what I see of as, the, as the, the present of palliative care and how it's informed by the past, I wanna tell you about a 47 year old woman who presented uh, last year uh, with two months of abdominal pain and weight loss to the Lachine Hospital. She was transferred then to um, uh, the Glenn site where she had a CT scan that showed a pancreatic mass um, with uh, metastatic disease in her abdomen. She uh, was kept in the emergency, she was admitted to the internal medicine team, to the internal medicine team in the emergency department, and she spent a week there uh, trying to figure out next steps. And, um, and her pain was not well controlled in that time. She was discharged home with some pain medication. Uh, she came back to the hospital two days later and again spent a week in the emergency department. Uh, as a result of pain and other discomforts. Um, and she was again admitted to the internal medicine team. She was subsequently discharged, at which point she went and had chemotherapy, had one session of chemotherapy. Two days later, she presented again to the emergency department with nausea and pain. And uh, she spent another week in the emergency department admitted under internal medicine service. Uh, she went home and two days later, she came back to the hospital. Um, where she spent another uh, several days before making a decision herself um, and telling the oncologist that she did not want to pursue any further disease modifying therapy, that she didn't think that it was going to be helpful to her. And, um, and at that point, we received this consult, Transition to Palliative Care. It was the first time in nearly four weeks of this woman's life that we were consulted for, uh, consulted uh, as palliative care clinicians, and despite her presenting with issues that we are sort of have developed expertise in managing. She was admitted to our palliative care unit, and we took care of her for about uh, just a little over a week, I believe, or two before stabilizing. We stabilized her pain quite quickly, got her much more comfortable, transferred her to a hospice in the community where she died a couple weeks later. So this woman spent about four weeks, of, well, six of the last eight weeks of her life in our hospital. Four of those weeks were spent in the emergency department, mostly uh, in a state of discomfort um, for issues that we're well trained to, to equip. So I think um, now if you could ask yourself, like, why did this happen? Why was palliative care not called? And I think it's because we think of palliative care as what happens on the top. And because we may not have the skills to talk about how um, palliative care can be integrated. And we worry, I imagine, I know that we worry about what it means to patients when we suggest that palliative care should be involved. And so this is how we talk, think about how we need to uh, rethink the future of palliative care in our own institution. I like to imagine a future in which this woman who had two, two teenage children, again, she was in her late forties, working woman, um, married, you know, could have done better from the first time she was, cons from the first time she came into the emergency room, if palliative care had been consulted immediately, I think her pain could have been better managed. She may even have been able to tolerate treatment better and may have made different decisions about, um, about uh, treatment moving forward. So I think what we see currently, and again, this sort of stems from 
the past of this institution is that doctors associate palliative care with giving up, hopelessness, failure, or dying. Doctors refer to palliative care then late or not at all. Uh, the patient has a crisis or is dying. Palliative care is then consulted, and then the patient dies, reinforcing the idea that palliative care is for the dying. And then society fears palliative care. And it starts all over again. So I think the, the other effects of this is that the palliative care clinicians experience moral distress because we um, find people who have been in, you know, sometimes in our care systems for quite a while, um, suffering in ways that we're well equipped to treat. And, that patient, and then patients and families feel abandoned by their clinicians because they find themselves in the emergency room being told by a resident that they're dying and, and really uh, haven't been able to talk to their physician about it. This leads to strained relationships with oncology clinicians, both for patients um, and, and, and for clinicians and, and, um, and other clinicians, I would say as well, but perhaps less so because cancer care is so much a part of what we do in palliative care. But then there are also these negative associations with MUHC cancer care and MUHC care in general, because people, when they come, when they, when they realize what palliative care can bring to their care, they feel really good about it. And they wonder, and they ask us questions like, why didn't we get this sooner? So this is a video that captures, I think, a little bit about what it feels like um, sometimes in, uh, in palliative care. Hi, we got a call that this house is on fire. How can we be helpful? Well, the house is on fire, but I'm worried if you go in there it might send the wrong message. Wait, what? I'm with the fire department. Yes, I know. I think you could be really helpful, but I think the family might be worried something is wrong if the fire department shows up at their house. But something is wrong. Their house is on fire. Do you think there's any way you could talk to them? but not use the word fire? What? I just think if the family hears the word fire, they might lose hope. But I am with the fire department and I am here to help this family with their fire. Right, right, totally. I think you could be really helpful, but I'm just not sure this family is in a place where they're ready to meet the fire department right now. Can we call you the water support team? So oh, just a little, um... Palliative care doctors find this really funny because we often, you know, we often have conversations that are something similar to like this. Like, could you go see the patient, but not tell or the family, and but not tell them you're the palliative care team because we don't want to scare them. So these are three or more studies, actually a few more studies that should inform our thinking about the role and value of palliative care and serious illness care. The first was a landmark study published in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine by a team from the Massachusetts General Hospital led by Jennifer Temmel. And um, this was a really a landmark study for, for multiple reasons. So what they did was they took about 200 patients, 200 plus patients, and they randomized, these are patients with a new diagnosis of advanced lung cancer, meaning lung cancer that had metastasized from its original location. And they randomized them to either usual care or to, um, to an early, a palliative care visit within eight weeks of their, uh, of their diagnosis of advanced cancer. Um, and then they were seen monthly by the interdisciplinary palliative care team. Uh, the study the the study was well randomized. Um, patients were mostly in their sixties, mostly male, uh, mostly white, uh, really reflecting um, population um, in Boston at this institution. Um, and um, again, they were receiving a variety of treatments. I think that the treatment has changed for cancer care in the interim, but um, but I will point out that here that um, there were high rates of anxiety and depression. In this, uh, in this cohort. So in terms of the analysis of quality of life outcomes at 12 weeks, they used the FACT L as the main quality of life score, a lung cancer specific um, quality of life measure. Um, they found that there was significant differences in quality of life in patients who received uh, early palliative care versus standard care. Um, uh, this is the 6.5 difference um, with uh, in the uh, in both the the general fact scale and the sub and the subscales, um, significantly the depression and anxiety scales were significantly different in these groups. The biggest effects here were seen um, in the twelve week outcomes uh, in comparison of depression. I think one thing that's really important to think about is the fact that uh, someone said recently um, at our palliative care congress that depression is time that you never get back. 
when you feel depressed, like the, those, that's time that is lost to you in your life in some way. And I was really struck by that. And it helps me interpret this data and think about what the impact is for these patients who may, you know, who may be in the last months of their life, who are having an intervention that is essentially cutting their, dep the, their rates of, uh, of depression in half. Um, this is extraordinary. And I think it's important to know that there is no pharmacologic uh, um, avenue to achieve these same outcomes for depression, certainly. I'll show some similar uh, effects from a different study in a moment. Um, the, the finding that kind of blew everybody away and made palliative care doctors really excited was, was one that was not really, um, it wasn't the point of the study to measure differences in mortality, but they did find that on average patients who received early palliative care lived two to three months longer. And I think this makes sense in two ways. One is that um, we, when people feel, but the, the best predictor of how people, um, how long people are gonna live is their functional status. And when people feel better, they, um, they have better function. So I took care of a woman yesterday, for example, who has uncontrolled pain. And as a result of this pain, she's not walking around. And so she's in this vicious cycle of getting weaker, spending less time doing the things that she can do, getting weaker as a result. And, and we've, we see that a lot. And so intervening to disrupt the cycles of dysfunction, vicious cycles of dysfunction um, that occur because people don't feel well is part of how I think this effect is achieved. The other is because sometimes people receive therapy that actually shortens their life. And um, when we assume that people um, that people's only goal is living longer and we give them chemotherapy, successive rounds of chemotherapy that reflect that, sometimes they actually do work worse. And so I think it's important that we um, recognize that. And I think that's reflected to some degree in this data. Just so that you are convinced that this isn't an American phenomenon alone. This was a study led by uh, Camilla Zimmerman at uh, Princess Margaret Hospital, and this was a much larger multi-site uh, study of, um, of patients in Canada who were randomized to, by the, at the clinic level to, uh, to early palliative care versus standard cancer care. And um, this, uh, this is sort of describes, I'm happy to share these slides with anybody, but these slides describe sort of what early palliative care looked like versus standard care. And it, you can see, for example, that in the early palliative care group, patients received a once monthly visit or more often if necessary. And, um, and standard care, um, sometimes patients were referred to palliative care, but, um, but it was on an ad hoc basis. Um, and you can see that this is the number of visits that pa patients in the intervention group got versus the control group. You can see it's you know, quite a lot of visits um, in the palliative care side and in the control group very few, some admissions to the palliative care unit, some inpatient palliative care consultations, home nursing referrals, et cetera. And that's sort of the level of intensity of palliative care in those groups. And I think this is a big table. I don't want you to look at all of it, but I'll just show you that at four months, the FACET SP is a measure of spiritual well-being. The quality qual e is a measure of quality of life. Uh, ESAS is one we're familiar with in terms of symptom control and quality of life. And FAM care is a, uh, is a caregiver measure. And you can see in each of these measures, there's a statistically significant improvement for the in intervention group versus the control group um, at four months. And, and so I think, you know, this is another study that adds to the, our understanding that palliative care really improves quality of life in multiple dimensions. Um, this is a, a very large uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that was completed by a group at uh, King's College London. And there's, a, the, there's both the Cochrane stud, study, both the Cochrane publication and a larger NHS um, funded um, study that is probably two or 300 pages long that describes everything about this study. But I wanna share with you what their conclusions were regarding the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of hospital-based palliative care for adults with advanced illness in general. So this is just, you know, it's been hard. We have, because most of our work has focused on patients with cancer, um, I think we've understood less about the impact of palliative care on patients with, without cancer. And so, um, which is a, a lot of the patients that you take care of in this group. So um, this was a study, they looked at 42 RCTs of over 8,000 participants. 14 of the 42 were non-cancer studies and seven of them were mixed studies. So both cancer and non-cancer. And there were multiple care models. So inpatient consultation, palliative care units, um, outpatient consultation, mixed, most, all of them having something to do with a hospital. 
And these are the, um, of the outcomes that they found, um, statistical, statistically significant improvements or trends towards improvement. You can see the 10 studies showed an improvement in quality of life, uh, improved in two studies showed improvement in patient satisfaction, six studies, symptom decreased symptom burden, improved depression in eight studies, preferred location of death. And these are the these are the standard mean differences across these studies. And you can see that there's sort of a small to moderate effect size in these um, with the exception of preferred location of death, which is uh, these are patients who said they wanted to die at home and who died at home. Um, you know, I think it's worth noting that about 85% of patients in of patients in Canada, or people in Canada say they would like to die at home and about 20 to 30% do, I think, across the board. So it's, it's small, possibly less. You'll notice that there were trends in these studies towards improvements in pain um, and anxiety, um, but these were not statistically significant across all of these studies. So it's interesting because I think when people talk about want to sell what we do for patients um, in the hospital with palliative care, they often the first thing they start with is pain. And that's not a bad thing because I think it's true that we help people with their pain, but it's also not the, the whole story. Um, this is a trial that I was involved with. Um, and looking at a, a primary palliative care intervention. So that is palliative care, a, a, an intervention that was designed for oncologists and others who care for people with serious illness, but for non-palliative non care specialists. And this was a cluster randomized trial uh, run at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, uh, 278 uh, patients with advanced cancer, and there are 91 oncology clinicians. The clinicians were randomized. This would be mostly physicians and a couple of physician assistants and NPs were randomized to either receive a training in, in the use of a serious illness conversation guide um, or not. And uh, and then those who and then we ran and then we um, uh, we recruited from with from those clinicians who served as the cluster um, their patients and and their caregivers and in fact we only enrolled patients who had an eligible caregiver uh, for the study so i think these are the these are some of the the highlights you know the primary outcome of the study was goal concordant care um, which was a uh, we, we we weren't we didn't end up being powered to to study the primary outcome and We've written subsequent papers about, about how we measured goal concordant care. I think it's an incredibly difficult thing to measure. Um, and then the other co-primary outcome was peacefulness at the end of life, and there was no difference according to a peace scale. However, among the secondary outcomes, um, there was no difference in therapeutic alliance. There was a statistically significant difference in the rates of moderate to severe anxiety that were cut in half. Um, in the control versus the uh, intervention group, and uh, similarly with in, with depression, and these were these effects were durable at 14 and 24 weeks. Again, there is no there's no uh, we don't have a drug that will do this. Possibly psilocybin. Um, for those of you who are keeping track of um, updates in psychedelic therapy, it may be one, but it's hard to deliver at scale. Um, and what I think is important to say here is this was a conversation that was delivered by a non-palliative care doctor that resulted in these significant findings, mental health improvements in patients uh, with advanced cancer. We found that patients had better illness understanding. One said, when I talk to my family, I tell them what the doctor said. It's not a death sentence, but the doctor has to tell us. You can see that there's somewhat of an internal contradiction there. And now we're treasuring every day we have together. They described improved relationships with clinicians. One patient said, I felt more valued as a patient, like we got a little bit closer. An increased focus on practical planning. Another said, I came home and had this conversation with my daughter and have been working on a living will and who's in charge of making my medical decisions if I cannot, so my wife and kids know my final wishes. Clinicians found that the serious illness conversation guide was effective and efficient. It increased satisfaction in their role. Um, they had reduced anxiety in having serious illness conversations. And I think it's important for all of us to reflect on like, what is it like for us when we have, when we know that we have, there's a patient or a family that we need to talk to about difficult news, about changes in their, in their diagnosis or their prognosis. Um, it's, it is anxiety provoking for us. And I think if we have the skill, the skill set um, or the tools, it makes it a little bit less anxiety provoking. And then people reported improvements in their patient-centered communication skills with a high degree of uh, significance. One clinician said, I feel more comfortable and empowered to have these conversations with my patients. 
So, you know, this is a, again, this is a, in contrast to the other studies, which are those either in, uh, in, in individual studies or in um, systematic reviews that show um, the impact of palliative care. This is sort of showing the impact of some of the knowledge, attitude, and skills that can be learned by generalists in, uh, as part of their palliative care, their generalist palliative care skill set. Um, I think I want to come back a little bit, which is sort of another uh, sort of summary study, uh, a meta-analysis of RCTs looking at survival and quality of life in patients with advanced cancer. And this sort of builds on the, the, the first two studies I showed, um, but it does show that am among these high quality RCTs, um, there was a statistically significant difference in longevity um, and uh, in quality and quality of life for these patients. This is a, uh, let's see if I have the... Uh, Yeah, so this is, uh, this is quality of life, and this is longevity. There are other studies that looked at the, like the duration of palliative care and how much that impacts the survival benefit. And basically, the earlier people get palliative care, the, the longer, the better their survival benefit. So I think it really begs the question, like, if we are really concerned with helping people live as long as possible, which is kind of the raison d'etre of our treatment, we should be thinking about integrating palliative care earlier because it's part of how we help them achieve this aim. And even if they don't live longer, because that wasn't really the point of these studies, um, they live better. Um, I think the evidence is, is clear about that. And, and uh, a study which I won't share today, but is a meta-analysis looking at sort of the, the, uh, the value of palliative care from a cost perspective. It is at least a value neutral proposition within health systems. And there are many studies that show that it improves the the um, the the value of care that lowers the cost of care for a given quality level. Um, it's partly a result of all of this work that um, the uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology um, issued guidelines. And in fact, this is slightly out of date because we just um, I had the opportunity to lead this last revision of the ASCO guidelines. The American Society of Clinical Oncology is probably the largest cancer guideline organization. Um, and uh, they recommend early integration of palliative care into the course of serious illness. This is their key recommendation that patients with advanced cancer, whether patient or outpatient, should receive dedicated palliative care services early in the disease course concurrent with active treatment. Um, and that referring to pa patients to interdisciplinary palliative care teams is optimal. Services may complement existing programs. Uh, and patient providers may refer caregivers of patients with early or advanced cancer to palliative care services. So that's great. I think that, um, you know, that makes us feel good. Um, on the other hand, like if every patient who was in this hospital, for example, or in our cancer center with advanced cancer was referred to us all of a sudden, we'd be kind of screwed. Um, we, we just don't have that capacity. And so I think, and that's actually true everywhere. There are multiple studies that show that the palliative care workforce um, is insufficient currently and dramatically insufficient in an aging society with increased incidence of serious illness, um, which we are all facing um, you know, with, with the demographic shifts um, in front of us. And so there's been, the, I think the current state of the science in palliative care is figuring out what is the care delivery model that helps as much as possible meet more precisely the needs of patients uh, with uh, advanced, with serious illness um, in a more precise way. So for example, um, if you look at this figure on the left, um, you can see that um, if we take all of these patients with who are eligible for palliative care on the basis of stage four disease, again, this is focused on cancer, but extrapolate out to those with serious illness, you're going to, first of all, you're going to overwhelm the system. And then there are going to be a bunch of people who probably don't need us, um, uh, who don't have the kind of, um, you know, problems that we're well equipped to deal with or, um, on the basis of their disease. And so the idea with precision palliative care as articulated in this article is that we we look at the group of patients who may be eligible and then we apply standardized assessments to try to understand what they really need. Like, do they have severe symptoms? Do they have disease progression? Do they have some sort of spiritual or ex existential crisis or caregiver distress? Um, we don't want patients with spiritual ex or existential crisis referred to physicians, not because we don't think physicians can be compassionate humans that can help with that, but because there are people that are better than that than physicians for dealing with that. And I think, for example, in our system, we have a spiritual care team, we have can support, at least on the cancer side, and we can try to figure out based on what patient, patients actually need, where they should need to go to, to get part of 
part or all of the multidisciplinary experience of palliative care. Hmm. Or, you know, we can figure out, for example, what are the interventions that every clinician in this hospital is well trained to do? For example, having a serious illness conversation that we know can have important impacts on patients' uh, well being. So, what does the future of palliative care look like at the MUHC? I think it's important to share with you what our values are so that you can hold us accountable to these. Uh, they include access as we provide rapid access to the right services at the right time, that we're innovative and we do world-class research and continue qual continuous quality improvement, that we promote continuity, that people see their entire team for their entire journey, equity, we use data to promote justice, uh, precision, that is we're responding to the right needs that patients have, uh, communication to ensure that care is driven by values and goals, uh, there's another funny video done by the same person, the uh, the uh, the sort of end of which is like uh, the conclusion is like goals before holes, because the guy is talking about putting in a tra how the patient needs a tracheostomy and the, and the palliative care clinician says, well, what are the patient's goals? And he's like, what are you talking about? And she, he says, the patient needs a tracheostomy. And she says, yeah, but what is the patient expecting and hoping to get out of this? And the doctor says, I don't know what you're talking about. And so again, the sort of goals before holes is important. Um, and then finally, joy. I think people would be surprised. Uh, you know, often when palliative care clinicians meet people at cocktail parties and tell them what they do, it's a very quick way to shut down a conversation. Um, or people say things like, oh my gosh, that's so depressing, or how do you do that? Um, I think people would be surprised if they spend time on our palliative care unit to find that this is one of the few places in the hospital where I think people consistently experience joy. They also experience sadness. But I think that when people um, have the safe space to feel well and reflect upon, um, you know, what their what their life has meant, um, as is often the case when people come to the palliative care unit um, and have an opportunity to experience time with family, they do experience joy. We experience a lot of joy on our unit. And I think um, I find that to be unique in the hospital. Um, and so um, if anybody wants to come see that, you're welcome to come spend time with us. And what do we believe? I don't believe any person is palliative. Okay, again, I think that this uh, reinforces an outdated model of care um, and, it, and it contributes again to this vicious cycle of palliative care beliefs. Palliative care furthermore is not a destination nor something you go into. Again, I think we have to check ourselves because this language I think is ingrained in us from a long time. You know, the 50 years of palliative care as it's existed in this institution, there was a long time where this was exact, this was very precisely what happened. You went into palliative care, but the evidence suggests that that's not how we should talk about it. Because when we do, patients think, oh, you're abandoning me. I'm, I'm not going to see this doctor anymore, a doctor with whom they built relationships sometimes over years. Palliative care is active treatment. So when we say that you're done with active treatment, now you're going to palliative care, I think, again, it gets people freaked out because we provide a lot of active treatment on our floors and in our consult services. And then finally, neither our expertise nor access to our care is determined by level of care, okay? Someone does not have to be level of care C or D for you to consult us. Sometimes the only difference between someone who is quote unquote level of care A and level of care D is a good conversation about what's likely to happen to them, okay? And what their goals and values are, okay? So, so I don't want that to be a limitation and, and I certainly don't, um, you know, I think the case before that I discussed illustrates how that the negative potential negative consequences of an idea about how palliative care is tied to either, you know, not having active treatment or a certain level of care. And I have this vision for a world-class leading supportive and palliative care division. If this is the first institution in the world in which palliative care existed, I think we should be a leading institution globally in how we provide palliative care and that we have a high functioning, high priority hospital service that provides up-to-date clinical care with a stable and happy workforce. And so this is what we're this is what we're building for. And I just want to point out, because a lot of the focus is on cancer in our, in our work, that I think we need to have a robust non-cancer palliative care program. And we've already started to work on this with, on, with uh, cardiology. And I think it's been a great benefit to both the um, cardiology clinicians, to us in terms of our scope of practice and knowledge, and certainly the patients. Okay, so what are some future initiatives that I think will help um, bring palliative care, bring the, our institution into the future of palliative care, and, and really, again, center center our institution uh, in a global discussion about palliative care and, and how it's practiced. The first is called the Interprofessional McGill Program in Advanced Communication Skills, and the second is the CEDARS Program in Whole Person Cancer Care. 
Uh, the Interprofessional McGill Program in Advanced Communication Skills, or IMPACTS, um, is, in, uh, is sort of conceptualized as a clearinghouse for training and implementation resources around the kind of evidence-based communication practices that we know make a huge difference for patients and clinicians alike. And so, for example, the Serious Illness Conversation Guide that you see on the right is adapted from the Serious Illness Conversation Guide um, at, that was developed by Ariadne Labs, where I worked previously, and, um, and that was the focus of the trial that I shared with you that demonstrated such important outcomes for mental health in patients with advanced cancer. Um, the left is a diagram that represents sort of the implementation framework that helps ensure that all patients in a, in a given system are treated and cared for on their own terms. Um, and, um, and because really, you know, implementing a communication focused intervention and transforming a culture of care is really an implementation challenge more than anything else. And so we're bringing these tools um, to, to bear in really trying to transform the culture of serious illness care at this institution. And my hope is that in a few years, we can say that, um, that training, in this pro training in this program or some aspect of our training is mandatory for all clinicians, because this is something that's happened in other institutions like MD Anderson, uh, Cedar sinai Stanford. And I think that this is the kind of caliber of institution that we uh, aspire to be. Um, the CEDARS program in whole person cancer care is a new paradigm of supportive and palliative care services in which we're trying to move from a reactive model in which a patient presents to a clinician, very busy clinician often, and the clinician has to make a decision about, how are we doing on time? Good, good. Um, Clinician has to make a decision about who to refer to. They're not always sure who to refer to. Sometimes they refer to psychosocial oncology. Sometimes they refer to palliative care. Sometimes they refer to a uh, cancer pain clinic. And, um, and sometimes they refer to cancer pain because they don't want to mention the word palliative care, even if a patient would really benefit from a more, uh, a more robust uh, palliative specialist palliative care experience. And so now that results in a situation where referrals are imprecise. They happen often very late in the course of illness. And so the idea is to create a sort of supportive and palliative care exoskeleton for the patient uh, experience in which we are using uh, patient reported outcome measures and other data to try to understand the needs of patients and refer them proactively to the services that we have available. It will also help us understand the degree of need for the services that we have and help us provide a more uh, data-enabled, precise uh, precision palliative care. And again, this is very much aligned with the state of the science. I think everybody's trying to figure out how to use PROMS to better utilize palliative care services. Oh, I kind of skipped over, I kind of, uh, I kind of um, uh, jumped the gun on this slide, but this is sort of what it looks like now. Again, the clinician identifies the patient distress and refers to one of our services. I, uh, we've already sort of started to move towards a model where some of these are, are sort of just embedded in what we call the serious, the, the cancer support of care clinics, which is actually what it says on the door. Um, and so clinicians will refer to that instead. Um, and then in the future, the system will identify patient distress. Um, the system will recommend referral based on what the patient is and the clinician will provide an assent for that. Um, and then we can add, the, add in these other um, services um, in a more robust way. So I think this is, this is what we're hoping to build uh, in order to, well, we're in the midst of building this. We have funding to build this program and, um, and we're just getting all of our, our ducks in a row now. I, you know, I think this is for cancer care. I think in the future, it would be great if this represented care for all people affected by serious illness, because um, we know that even though um, prognosis is a little less um, um, predictable in patients with say advanced heart, lung, and kidney disease. Um, we know that they can also die suddenly or have um, significant changes in their stat in their health status and, and providing them palliative care earlier in one form or another um, can be very helpful. Okay, so how can you help? So what I'm wanting your help with is to build a virtuous cycle of palliative care beliefs in which clinicians associate palliative care with better quality of life and better outcomes, that clinicians therefore refer to palliative care early, that patients prepare for crises and avoid them, and that patients die peacefully in a place of their choice as a result. And then that society recognizes that the best advanced cancer care and in fact the best serious illness care includes palliative care. And then repeat. There's a great metaphor that Camilla Zimmerman wrote about um, in a piece in JAMA um, called palliative care is the umbrella, not the rain. And this is a metaphor to guide conversations in advanced cancer she was talking about, but I think it applies uh, to all patients with serious illness. 
particularly those in the hospital for whom access to specialist palliative care is, is readily available. So late palliative care in this top panel looks like this. Patients come in to see the, the doctor. A few months later, the doctor, they're caught out in the rain. The doctor runs out with the umbrella and says, here. And they said, thanks, we wish we had this earlier, versus early palliative care referral where the doctor hands them an umbrella and says, you know, just in case, a few months later, they're out in the rain, but they have an umbrella. And they said, so glad we had this when we needed it. And this is very simple and cute, um, but I think it illustrates a nice way to talk about palliative care or to think about palliative care moreover, um, which is that it's the umbrella, not the rain, just like it's the fire department, not the fire. Um, I think just to add to this, it's really, you know, people often say to me, why don't you just change the name palliative care? I'm resistant to that for two reasons. First of all, we are in an institution in which palliative care took its name. I feel very, I would feel very troubled to change the name of palliative care in the institution in which it was born. Um, the second is if we don't change people's thinking about palliative care, then whatever name we choose will in 10 years be the next boogeyman for patients and doctors alike. Because if we don't, we need to change our thinking about what it is. And I think these metaphors are helpful in part. What can you say to introduce palliative care? So you might say something like, I'd like you to see my colleagues in palliative care. We know that palliative care helps people with serious illness live and feel better no matter the outcome of their treatment. Or palliative care is an extra layer of support for you and your family while we continue to treat this cancer or heart failure or lung disease. Or this is a really difficult situation. I'd like to involve our palliative care team because they can really help us and families think through difficult treatment choices. Okay, what's really hard is when um, it's hard for everybody, literally everybody, when a patient, for example, has been in the ICU for 100 days, as we know happens or, or more. Okay, and all of a sudden, things are really not looking good. And then they call palliative care. And we go in and patients are upset because they don't know what it means that we're all of a sudden there. Um, and, and our clinicians have a huge work, a huge amount to do because you know, patients are often, we're often consulted in the hours or days before people die. And like, it's a lot of, just, it's, it really makes our work much harder when we have to sort of um, encounter people right at the very end of their life. Um, and so involving them easier can be helpful and using decision-making and quality of life as a, as a goal for that can be really helpful. Here's another, here's another video just to uh, break things up. I think illustrates uh, illustrates this a little bit. I don't want you to be scared, but I'd like to consult palliative care to see you. Why would I be scared? It's just that I know palliative care gets a bad reputation sometimes. Why do they have a bad reputation? It's not that, it's just, you know. What's palliative care? Well, a palliative care team is an interdisciplinary group of people that can help be an extra layer of support for patients and families dealing with serious illness. They think of the patient as a whole person and can help with physical, emotional, and spiritual distress. They help prioritize quality of life and can assist with planning for the future. That sounds amazing. Why would I be scared of them? Well, ah, uh, I'm not scared. Are you? So I think that shows that, you know, it's a good way of talking about what we do. Um, so I'll leave you with this. Uh, Balfour Mount um, said something which I think is really important, which is that what we're trying to do in palliative care and all medical care, and I emphasize all medical care, is to establish healing connections to be experienced by those who are ill or dying and their families. Um, and so um, I you know, ask for your help in make, helping us make this a reality for our patients here at the MUHC, and I'm really grateful to be here today. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Justin, for this really thoughtful and comprehensive, important and practical lecture. Um, I see we have a lot of comments here. Are there any questions in the in the audience? Um, how much time do we have? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Thurwell. Uh, thank you for a very comprehensive review. Uh, uh, all the right questions. Um, the question I have just is when does the term hospice come in and, and do you use it at all or mm -hmm. not simply at all? So thanks, Michael. Yeah, that's a great question. So hospice, uh, hospice is used differently in different places. So for example, in the United States where I trained, 
hospice is a hospice is a benefit that's sort of allotted by the government that says you have for people who are eligible for who have a prognosis of likely less than six months, they can receive a host of services, typically at home, but also in inpatient facilities that are called hospice. In Canada, like in like in England, in fact, hospices are typically thought of more as a place. And so we often use hospice in the context of referring people to one of the maison soins palliative or palliative care residences that are around us in, on the island of Montreal and, and around um, throughout Quebec um, as, a, as really a location of care. And those um, institutions have to draw lines about to whom they provide care. And they usually have a prognostic, uh, they, people usually have to have an estimated prognosis of less than three months to go to those places. But that's how we think of hospice in Quebec. Mark? Justin, I wonder, thanks very much for a fantastic talk and thanks for your, your leadership uh, in this area. Um, I wonder if you could comment on, uh, you know, going back to the original story that you told about uh, the woman with pancreatic cancer spending three weeks in the emergency room. I wonder if the, uh, any of the research that you, uh, that you that you presented also demonstrates a reduction in the length of stay in acute care hospitals for patients with uh, serious illness. Thanks. Um, so the question that people didn't hear was about whether or not there's evidence to show that palliative care reduces length of stay. Um, Mark, as you know, I've tried to make the case that we could be a better part of helping reduce the length of stay in the emergency room, at least, um, and, and de, you know, un, um, unburdening our clinicians there. Um, I don't know of data that shows um, uh, length of stay entirely in hospitals, but there is some important new data from the emergency rooms, both at uh, a study done in, in San Diego and a study done at Mass General Hospital that shows that an embedded palliative care team in the emergency room does reduce length of stay in the emergency room. So um, I, you know, I want us to be a part of the solution in this hospital to that. I think everybody has become numb to the overcrowding alerts that we get every day at whatever time of day. And I think that we have a role, you know, if you think about the fact that probably um, half the patients or more in the emergency room have a serious illness, and at least half of them are probably there for reasons that we're well equipped to sort of diagnose and treat um, in terms of their symptoms, um, we could have a role in getting them out sooner. There's a couple of questions in the chat related to what we have in terms of resources available, in particular for non-cancer palliative care at the MUHC and potentially some cases of being sort of refused because they're non-cancer. Can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I've asked this of my colleagues, many of whom are here in this room. Um, there, uh, there are certain populations of people who have um, the kinds of symptoms that we would be well managed to treat, like pain, for example, that do not have a serious illness. And so I think that those are patients who we should probably not be seeing and trying to find other ways to, to treat. Um, however, if you hear, you know, I've asked my team, to, like in general, to to see patients when we're consulted. I think that anytime we're consulted, it's a cry for help, either from the team or the or the patients. Often, pa often teams feel stuck about what to do. Often patients feel bad. And I think we should do whatever we can with the resources we have available um, to help, man help teams manage those patients. Um, what, I, what I would ask in return is that, you know, as much as possible, teams who are consulting us recognize that they have something to learn from every consultation and where possible participate with the care in us because we need, you know, it's clear that we need to diffuse some of the primary palliative care skills um, in our community to change how we do this overall in our institution. And so we want you to be involved. If we come for a family meeting, we want you to be there. Um, but I would say that if you have a patient without cancer who you really would benefit, who think would benefit from our help, you call us. And if for any reason, you know, the message is anything other than, you know, we're happy to help, then please let me know, because I think it's important for us to to at least discuss those as a team when they come up, because sometimes there's reasonable disagreements about whether or not a patient should be seen. And at least we can discuss that as a team if it's not clear. Can you comment on um, the role of palliative care and the impact on requests for made in particular as well time palliative care decreased requests for made? Um, I, so I don't think we have the data on this yet to suggest whether or not palliative care makes a difference in made consultation. I think anecdotally, um, well, I should say there's some data being starting to be presented now that suggests that palliative care consultation doesn't necessarily change rates of medical aid in dying. Um, 
I think that what, you know, I'll take the chance to say that in Quebec, I think it's important that we recognize that um, choosing MAID or palliative care as an option for end-of-life care, as is structured by the current sort of government end-of-life care plan, is a false choice. And that I would say that almost any patient with a any patient with a serious illness who is requesting made should certainly have a palliative care consult because often those requests are made under duress and a, and a made request should never be, I mean, made should never be given under duress. It's, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a light switch, it's a process. And I think that um, that process should include a thorough evaluation of the reasons that they're requesting made. Um, and if they're amenable to what we can do, then that's wonderful. There's no overlap between the two. No, but we work really closely with Veronique Fraser's team. So I think, you know, we all know her and, and I think that we we aspire to be in, you know, close contact with her. Um, but certainly the team should know that if they're putting in a request for MAID, it's really helpful for us to uh, to be able to assess those patients. There's a question in the chat about uh, neurocognitive uh, disorders, uh, uh, the role on neurocognitive disorders and uh, comment on geriatric palliative. Um, let's see how to answer that question. Um, we have some expertise in neuropalliative care at the MNI. Dr. Jeff Hall and Justine Gauthier are a really well-established, two small, but two-person team of people working on neuropalliative care issues on the inpatient setting at, um, at the MNI. I think they may also do some clinic. I don't know. Is anybody... Yeah, they do some clinic there as well. So this is something that we could um, work on. I think neurocognitive, you know, if we think about dementia, how we provide care, palliative care for people with dementia is a is a really, is a big interest to, to the field and something we're still working out um, because the rates of dementia in an aging population are going to be going up. And we're still trying to figure out what's the scope of our practice in that, uh, in that realm. There's just a question about uh, lymphedema have any support for palliative care in those patients? So um, lymphedema is a consequence of cancer treatment, most often. So, um, oh, that's, yeah. So we actually have a, we have a, a, an extraordinary uh, and unique resource related to lymphedema here. It has long been embedded in our cancer center. Um, but it is a super regional center uh, focused on, uh, you know, lymphedema care. And I don't think it's limited. That care is not necessarily limited to um, to cancer care. I will say that that threatening for the, the funding for that is under threat. And so we're trying to figure out how to keep that clinic uh, and viable. Um, and I think that the more we understand about the need, the better we're going to be able to to advocate to address it. So I think if there's a if there's a population of people without cancer who have lymphedema that can be an, and a serious illness, um, then, um, then we should be thinking about how to provide care for them. We just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, there's a quick question about do medical students in trauma medicine, are people required to train in palliative care? Um, so yeah, you know, I will say, so coming from Harvard Medical School, where medical students had four hours of required palliative care, um, we're relatively fortunate at McGill in that our um, our medical students have about 21 hours of palliative care curriculum to which they are um, exposed over the course of their years, including um, not mandatory, but frequent rotations. Um, and I think we're actually working on mandatory rotations. Um, and so um, that's great. Um, I still think there's more to do. I think a lot of the, a lot of what Balfour Mount did in the early days in terms of education around communication and self-reflection and things like that got turned into the whole person care curriculum at McGill, which is great because he didn't want it to sit with palliative care alone. Um, I think that we have work to do to try to um, unite some of that so that it's clear, um, you know, for whom it benefits and how. Dr. Murray, who's there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was like, go ahead. That, go ahead that, that's fine. I Justin, thank you very much for this uh, great presentation on palliative care service. The question I have for you is considering the future demands uh, uh, and the reduced number of beds we have uh, at MUHC dedicated to palliative care, uh, what is your uh, networking with resources available in the community, including some homes that have uh, uh, palliative care beds, you know, yeah. residences dedicated to it? 
So I would say that our consult team has a really robust and ongoing discussion with the palliative care residences about where people go and when. And we were, we're constantly transferring p- patients to um, out to palliative care residences in the community. Um, I think it's a larger discussion with the government about how we build for the future because we're going to be we're behind now and we're going to be farther behind if you look at the demographic shifts in terms of our ability to care for people and so part of that's going to be places of care my my fundamental worry is that we are you know building a situation in which there are insufficient resources and in which the the best possible option for people is to choose um uh medical aid and dying and uh, because if we don't have the care institutions in which people will feel have confidence that they'll feel safe and well cared for, why would they not choose medical aid and dying? And that to me is extraordinarily sad. Um, Dame Cicely Saunders said famously, you matter and you matter until the end. But I think that our societal structures aren't necessarily um, set up to show that to people. Okay, on that note, uh, we will have to close the rounds. I will keep the chat open uh, if there's because there's a couple of questions and comments that we have not had a chance to answer. So I will ask Dr. Sanders if he could just maybe answer the questions sure. directly in the yeah, chat. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, really, for a terrific, uh, very, very helpful, Thank really you. informative <laughs> lecture. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thanks very much.